rock have you been under? I hope you feel encouraged this morning by our executive pastor, just bringing the thunder. Man, what a great word. I actually feel Troy brought such a great word. I just want to thank God for him, man. That was such an encouraging prayer time. And uh, I'm so grateful for what God's already done in this place this morning. Um, I want to celebrate a couple things before we dive into God's Word together. First of all, I want to celebrate that we have officially ended 21 days of prayer and fasting. Come on, fasting is good. And uh, I believe that uh, I've heard so many stories, actually, of people you've experienced a life change as part, I'm seeing heads nod, you've experienced a life change as part of 21 days of prayer and fasting. And uh, we're re- I'm getting ready for, we do it twice a year. We don't do the fasting twice a year. We do that in January, but we do 21 days again in August, in the middle of the year. And so I'm already excited for that. I know for myself, I've experienced a life change. I don't know, like Pastor Troy came and, you know, he always brings it, but then, like it's like it's gone to another level as a result of us taking dedicated times of prayer and fasting. Uh, fasting is good, but feasting is better. <laughs> <laughs> And so last night, Rachel and I started our fast on the Saturday night. So last night we ended our fast um, with a couple large pizzas. And I just got to let you know, I feel terrible right now. I feel awful. I feel sick. Uh, I got up this morning and I had my first coffee in 21 days. My mouth was happy. My body is thoroughly confused right now. And so... We might just be motoring through the message a little faster than usual. We're just like driving over speed bumps this morning. That's fine. We're just going to go quick because I got caffeine in me and my body's confused. But we're going to have a good time together. I also want to let you know that next week we're beginning a brand new message series. I'm I'm actually very excited about this series. Uh, I'm excited about every series, but I'm excited about this series. And specifically uh, because this series, we're going to press into some difficult conversations around what do you do when the culture around us is constantly changing, but God's word is timeless. You know, what do you do? Who are you when culture's changing? We're going to do a series called Culture Shock. You don't want to miss it. You want to be here with us. Today we are wrapping up, as, as Pastor Troy said, week number four of our Ready For It series, a series on new habits for a new year. And really the idea behind this series is that we all have hope. Thank God for hope. God actually wants to give you some new hope before you walk out of the building Today, God is all for hope. Pa- uh, Pastor Troy, we didn't even know that he was, I didn't know he was going to go off on hope. But this is like the, the start of our message again, just find hope. God has brand new hope for you. In fact, you might have already experienced that in the atmosphere of worship today. Thank God not only for hope, but God gives us the ability to experience life change. It gives us the power of the Holy Spirit within to change our lives, and we need that because how many know often what we have is some sky-level hopes, but some ground-level habits? I know I do. I've got some habits that haven't yet lined up with my hopes, and so this series has been about taking our habits and elevating them. And here's a little recap. Week one and habit number one was about first things first, putting God first in your life. And we said this. It was challenging and, and, and hopefully Uh, You've been thinking about this in your own life, that if God's in your life, but he's not first in your life, he's not in your life because God does not want to take and will not take a second place seat in your life. God's got to be first in your life. The second thing we talked about uh, week number two and habit number two is about changing our thinking. And we got these from kind of the progression of Romans 12 that says that we, first of all, we offer ourselves to God and we put him first, but then it says that God actually changes our thinking. And so new habits start not in the doing, but in the thinking. And then we got to week number three. Week number three and habit number three then comes out of that in Romans 12, verse two, which says, then then that we can discover what God's plan is, his good and his pleasing and his perfect will. So last week was about prioritizing our purpose. And so out of that, we've had putting God first and he changes our thinking. And then we begin to prioritize our purpose. Then we get to today and habit number four. And habit number four is a great habit. It's actually the glue that is going to enable you to keep on doing habits one, habits two, and habits number three. Habit number four is enables us to go through one, two, three regularly. Habit number four is this, that you've got to choose 
Right relationship. You got to choose right relationship. This is what the Bible says. Proverbs 27 says, A mirror reflects a man's face. But what he's really like is shown by the kind of friends he chooses. There's a lot in your life you can't choose. You didn't get to choose your family, right? You don't get to choose maybe even where you, you don't get to, certainly don't get to choose what country you're born into. You know, to some extent you can choose where you live, but largely, you know, that might be determined by, by wealth or other factors, sometimes that are out of your control. Maybe even the kind of job, maybe you've been in an industry for a long time. It's not like you could go and just choose, you know, something drastically different. You kind of feel like, man, I've got some narrow choices in some areas. You know where you always have a choice? The people that are around you in your life. And this is what the Bible says here is that, listen, if you want to know what's going on on the exterior of your life, you could just hold up a mirror. You can easily see. How can you tell what's going on the inside of a person? The Bible says it right here. I can just look at who you're hanging out with. I can know what's going on in your life based on who is the circle that you've surrounded yourself with. And so this morning, I want to talk about four verbs, four ways of making right relationships in our life. This series has been remarkably practical. Honestly, uh, I've actually intentionally stepped into almost a level of discomfort in preaching practical things so that you could have some steps to follow. And I just want to encourage you, hey, we've had a lot of practical steps in this series. Just latch on to as many as you can. Four verbs, four actions for right relationships this morning. And the first is this, that we need to, here's the verb, nurture our important relationships. You got to nurture your important relationships. Every relationship in your life right now is in some current state. You know, you might, for example, your marriage, it might be connected. You'd say, yeah, we're, we're feeling very connected these days. Or your marriage might feel disconnected. Uh, or you'd say, you know, we've got a great marriage, um, but right now we're at a season where it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not great, it's not terrible, it's kind of just maybe middle of the road. Every relationship in your life is in some sort of current state. And it's not in that state because the relationship itself is good or bad. It's in that state because of the way you have nurtured that relationship. The Bible says this. I want to talk from one of my favorite passages in the Bible, John chapter 17. Jesus prays for his disciples. I love it. He's talking about purpose. He's talking about what he's called them to do. And he prays for them. And, and this is what he says in verse 15 of John 17. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Now, notice, Jesus is interceding for his disciples. And, and here's some great news for you today. He's doing that for you right now. Hebrews chapter 7 makes it very clear that Jesus now lives to make intercession for you and I. So Jesus is before God the Father right now, and he's praying, and he's saying, protect them from the evil one. Lift them up, encourage them, give them hope. Holy Spirit, fill their lives today that they would know the presence of God, that they would know that you are with them. Breathe hope and breathe life. May they see the, the power and strength. Jesus is interceding on your behalf right now. I don't know if that gives you some hope. It gives me some hope. Verse number 16 says, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world, Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. I have sent them into the world. Jesus is praying for these 11 guys that are going to go out and they're going to do unique and independent things. They're going to travel to different places. They're going to have different calls on their life. And yet, he prays to the Father for them as a group. He says, I have sent them. Can I ask you this morning, who's your them? When Jesus is interceding for you and he says, he's praying for, you know, Susie. You know, I pray for Susie and, and, and I pray that you be with her and them that I have put with her. When he, when he names your them, who's he talking about in your world? Who's your them? Who's around you? Who is there that you know is taking you from your current level of habits to your sky level hopes. We've got to nurture our right and important relationships. I, I can tell you from my own life that there was a season, and now spe speaking specifically again about marriage, but this applies to every relationship, important relationship, your family, your kids, um, you know, your, your closest friends. There was, there's a season in our marriage 
when I didn't nurture the relationship, honestly, the way I should have. This was a few years ago, and I I loved Rachel, and I served her kind of the way I, I, I knew how. But to be honest with you, in that season, discovering what was in her heart and why it was important to her was not the top shelf in my world as, as it needed to be in that season. And uh, we actually went through a season where, where you might even say we were, we were actually feeling pretty disconnected, hadn't been nurturing that relationship. And I can tell you that over the past two years, Rachel and I have made a strong commitment to nurture our bond at the, at the top level. And I'm, I look back now, and I, I can honestly tell you, I will not drop that ball again in the way that I did. For us, actually, you know, we had, I, I wasn't necessarily nurturing it the way I should, and we actually had two life kind of interruptions that came along. The passing of Rachel's mom and us having kids around about the same time. And side note, I was in a coffee shop this week, and I, I, heard, I overheard a lady telling someone that she had just gotten pregnant on her honeymoon. And uh, I was just like, I don't know you. I, I don't know what's going on. I just need to come and pray for you right now. <laughs> Can, would you mind if I just laid hands on you? I, 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 I'm not weird, but you need this. Trust me. You need this. <laughs> Kids are a game changer. And we had that game changer at the same time as losing Rachel's mom. And, and it led to this disconnection. And over the last two years, we have had to decide that nurturing our relationship was going to come first. Listen, we started a church in a season where I can tell you, y'all weren't first. I love you, but you weren't first in my life. I, I, this is our community. This is our family. You, this is our welcome home. I love you, but I can tell you, I'm not going to put my wife at any time second. I have seen the benefits of nurturing that relationship first. I'm not going to drop that ball again. And maybe you'd say, you know, I've dropped the ball. I've dropped the ball in some relationship in my life. Maybe it's your marriage and you're like, we got to reinstitute date night. Or we got to find a way to begin to really nurture that relationship. And here's something else that's important. Don't think that because your relationship needs work that your relationship has a problem. I, I found in our relationship, our marriage is beyond what I ever thought marriage could be. It's incredible. I have also found it takes more work than I ever thought it would take. We have an incredible marriage. Do not think that because your relationship takes a lot of work that you have a good or a bad relationship. It, it, it's the best relationship I could ever have dreamed of, and it has cost more than I ever thought it was going to cost somebody. Hey, hey, let me know if you know you need to nurture your important relationships. Let me see your heads nod. Let me hear some amens this morning. We got to nurture our important relationships. The second verb I want to talk about today is we need to, here it is, repair some broken relationships. We need to repair broken relationships. In fact, you would say, you know what, I can't even nurture the relationship because right now the relationship's not even together. When I say repair broken relationship right away, someone, someone comes into your mind. You're thinking about some person, some relationship. You know you've got a broken relationship. And you might say, Pastor Shane, I don't know how I can repair this relationship because this other person does not want repair. The Bible actually speaks about that in Romans chapter 12. It says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as depends on you, live peaceably with all. If possible, so far as depends on you. So it is going to take two people in a relationship for that relationship to repair, and you might not have that. But how can you have the best opportunity to have repair in your broken relationships? Simply this. It's going to start with forgiveness. It's going to start. If you've got broken relationships, it's going to start with forgiveness. When the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Jesus gave them what is the Lord's Prayer. And it, you can find it in Luke chapter 11. It's, it's really more than just reciting those words. It's, a, it's an outline for how you ought to pray in your life every day on a daily basis. And there's not a lot of components that Jesus said that we were to pray every day. 
But one of the components he said that you would need on a daily basis is forgiveness. Don't you find that interesting? I don't know about you, but sometimes in my own world, I'm not thinking about forgiveness on a daily basis. Sometimes we think forgiveness is just like a one-shot deal. I make a decision to forgive and then I move on. The Bible says, no, forgiveness is a daily thing. You know what else I find interesting about the Lord's Prayer is that the location of forgiveness is not your conversation around your broken relationship. It's actually in the place of prayer. You choose to forgive when you see who God is and then you move out into the world and you repair your relationships because you're not gonna be able to forgive unless you can see the way that you've been forgiven. It was unmerited and it was undeserving. Forgive them their trespasses. Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. The only way we can truly forgive is when we see how we've been forgiven. And so you've got to repair some broken relationships. We've got nurturing important and we've got repairing the broken. The third Verb, the third action of, of right relationships today is, is you might need to end or at, at least redefine some unhealthy relationships. End or redefine some unhealthy relationships. And by the way, not talking about your marriage. <laughs> but if we're going to have right relationships, it's not just going to take knowing who are the right people that I need to add into my life, it is going to take understanding who are the people that it's time for me to actually move away from those relationships or at least redefine the nature of that relationship. The Bible says this in Proverbs 13, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Hanging out with the wrong people is not just a poor use of, of time. It'll bring harm to your life. So what are these relationships that might need to end? Maybe it's a, a Facebook conversation with an old fling, an old flame that your, your spouse is unaware of. Maybe it's a flirtatious relationship at work that, that really kind of seems harmless, it seems playful, it seems fun, because nothing's going to happen until something does happen and takes away everything in your life. There may be some relationships that it's just time to end them. Like literally to go to the place that you're like, I, if that's going on in your workplace, you might need to leave that job. If we don't make the decision to end unhealthy relationships, the Bible is very clear. It's not just, it's not just a poor use of time. They bring harm. Now, it might not be a relationship that needs to end. Maybe for you, you've got a relationship that might just need to be redefined a little bit. Maybe you're in uh, a relationship and you have gotten intimate before you have gotten covenant. Uh, translation, you know, away from the kind of the church language, you're having sex and you haven't put a ring on it yet. That relationship might need to be a little bit redefined. Now, let me just say, for those of you who are new to church, and I love, I love this about our church. I know when I actually speak on this topic that it speaks to a lot of people in the room. And I want you to know we're your family and, th and this is love and, and there's just, th here's the thing. This is not about sex being a bad thing. <laughs> I, I gotta be honest with you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you honestly, you, you might not have known this about me. I, I, I'm a big fan of sex. Sex is a good thing. <laughs> Got no problem saying it. In the right context, God wants you to have some more sex. In fact, for some of y'all, that's the way you need to start nurturing your important relationships. You just need to get, go home and have some more sex. And uh, right about now, there's some 16-year-olds in the room that are like, why did I sit with my parents today? Why? <laughs> it's gonna happen to me eventually. I don't know how we'll deal with it. But right now, if, you're, if your kids are sitting with you, just, just breathe in that awkwardness right now. Just, just let go of the tension. Nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. I didn't tell you what I was preaching on. And listen, you don't need to, you don't, if, if, you're, if you're having sex, and, and listen, here's, here's, the, here's the thing. God gave you that incredible experience so that you could experience intimacy uh, really in the context of forever. And you don't need to do it because a church told you to or because I told you to. 
quite honestly, it, it would just be, if you're here and you'd say, I want to put God in the top shelf seat of my life, you need God first in every relationship. And so don't do it because I said so, and, and don't feel that, uh, you know, the church is just preaching these things to kind of to take the fun out of your life. I, I hope you don't think that for a moment, but you might need to, in 2018, redefine some things about some relationships in your life. You've got to nurture the important relationships. You've got to repair the broken relationships. You might need to end or at least in some ways redefine some different relationships in your life. Now uh, we come to this fourth one and it's that you need to, we need to initiate some new meaningful relationships. We need, I honestly believe it's all of us. And you say, I've already got a lot of friends. The stats say that, you know, and you even just look around, a lot of us move. Every, every I don't know the exact percentage. I think it's like 20% of people are moving every five years. Or, like we're every, people are moving in and out of your life. This is transient. And the, the thing is, to be honest with you, once you're past kind of the university age or the start of your career or the start of your family, we, for, in large part, we stop doing this very well. And you need to begin to initiate some new and meaningful relationships. I, I've just decided in 2018, my ride or die list is going to increase. I'm going to increase. And, and here's the reason my list needs to increase. I, I've got hopes that are here, but the way I know how to live is here. And I need some people around me that can actually take me from the way that I know how to live to the place of my hopes. This last fall, I started... Um, I got connected with a group of, of church planters, guys that have started new churches, and uh, there was uh, 12 of us connect online uh, every single week on, on Skype. We have an hour and a half together, just talking about church, talking about life, talking about our marriage, just talking about, and, and not only that, Rachel and I have made the commitment that I'm actually going to, next month, I'm going to fly and meet these guys to spend time face to face. Listen, I, I, I'm not very good at these things. I, I'm not the, like, I'm not the extrovert go and add a whole bunch of new people to my life. In fact, Rachel and I, uh, we've been, we, we both love, very honestly, I, we love both of us having people over to our house. Like we'll have 15, 20, 30 people over to our house on a regular basis. The neighbors think we are categorically insane. Either that or they just don't like the parking issues, one or the other. In fact, some of our neighbors, this is true, Rach can attest to it, and some of you who, who've been around our house recently can attest to it. We've got neighbors showing up to our church functions because they're just like, hey, if you can't beat them, <laughs> join them. Right? Right? It's true. They'll bring over a bottle uh, uh, of wine and, and just sit down and hang out with our friends. And we're like, just go to it. Just go to it. That's awesome. That's great. We're going to hang out. We're going to have some fun. Um, I, we love that. I love having people in our house. But listen, here's, here's the reason that you might say, I don't need to initiate some new relationships. And, and I, I hear it all the time. You might say, you know what? I'm just not a people person. I, I hear you. Uh, you, you would say, I just don't recharge and refresh around people, and I just don't have a lot of time in my life, and so I don't really feel like I actually could initiate some new relationships. I hear you. I, I, I think I love having people over as much as Rachel, but the impact on us is quite different. When people leave our house, uh, I sit down on the couch, and I just kind of throw my arms out, and I'm exhausted. And then I look over at Rachel, and I'm like, hey, babe, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm just texting some friends right now. I just want to see when they can come over. I just like, you know, I just want to see... You know, I'm just like, well, they just left our house like five minutes ago, seeing if they could come back. I just feel like I need another hug. We just need to talk a little bit more. Like, you know, it's just like Rachel recharges, and there's people laughing in the front row because you know it's true. Rachel recharges around people. Understand, if you are in our home, I'm having a good time, and I want you there. Just know it's not really filling my tank, right? It's filling Rachel's tank. It's not filling my tank. I'm having a good time. I want you there. Let's party. Let's celebrate. But I'm going to recharge with a book and a latte. Thank you, Jesus. I'm back on course. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be posting a lot. I don't, like, you can unfollow me if you don't want to see seven coffee posts this week. I'm telling you, every time a coffee touches my lips, I'm taking a photo and letting you know this week. It is coming <laughs> into your Instagram. It's a commitment. It's my heart. So you say, I, I, I'm, not a, I, I'm not really a people person. No, you don't recharge around people, but you are wired a people person because you've got some sky level hopes and the way you know how to do life is right here and you need, how are you gonna get from here to there? God's intention is that you have some relationships where you would begin to see how you could do things differently to get from your ground level habits to your sky level hopes. Come on somebody, can I get an amen in the place this morning? 
<laughs> so we've talked about four verbs, four actions for these right relationships. We've got to nurture the important relationships. We've got to repair the broken ones. We've got to end, perhaps redefine uh, certain relationships. And then we've got to initiate some new relationships. That's a whole lot of practical stuff, right? Four points is a lot. I often have one. Four was a lot. I'm going to add three more. Just to, you know, buckle up. Three more things, because I want to talk about three relationships you need in 2018. Three relationships that you need in 2018. They're not the only relationships you need, but these are good ones. You need these in 2018. And you're going to think I have ulterior motives for point number one. I don't. I believe in my heart this is a word from God for you. First of all, you need to have my church. You got to have my church in your life. The place that you would say, that's my church. It's my church. Doesn't need to be this church. If, you, if this doesn't feel like home to you, I will honestly meet you in the lobby after the service today and, and write down a list of great churches in this city with God-loving, God-fearing pastors that are different than us. They do things differently. They have a different heartbeat for different areas of ministry. Listen, no church is perfect. No church does everything. If this is not home for you, literally, I, can, I honestly would, would love to send you to some great churches where you could be like, that is my church. That's my church. you got to have my church in your life, a place where you know you belong and a place where you're making a difference with your life. got to have my church. Maybe today's the day for you to say, you know, I'm diving into next steps. I don't, you know, I don't know what next steps is. I hear Troy talk about it. I hear Rachel talk about it. Next steps. Today is step number four. You can start at step number four. Step number four, we actually give you the 30 different ways that you could use the gift on your life in this church. It's, I'm not going to lie to you. It's about getting you on a team so that you can make a difference in your life. And we give you 30 options and, you know, just so that no one can be like, you know, I don't really think there's a place where I could be used by God in this church. No, you're going to be like, I don't even, that's a, give me, I don't even, give me an hour. I got to read through these, this, this long list. No, it's, you got to have my church. Got to have my church. Second relationship you need in your life in 2018, <laughs> you got to have some godly friends. Just got to have some godly friends. How do I know if they're godly? Does hanging around with them bring you closer to God? Like, I'm not just talking about people that go to church. That's not what I'm referring to. I mean people that you spend time with them and you get closer to God. That's what I mean by some godly friends. Hey, here's how we do it around here. Troy, Pastor Troy mentioned it. Uh, we do it in the context of our small groups. And I love the way he described it, like free market groups. Listen, to be honest with you, we don't care the reason that you gather. Uh, as he said, there's some groups. I heard about one this week. I saw some guys coming out of a Tim Hortons. And, and I was like, hey, they go to our church. I'm like, hey, guys, how you going? Oh, we're doing good, Pastor. We're just planning our small group. You know, we're going to be like going and shooting hoops and just doing all kinds of activities. And I'm like, man, that's great. Here's the reason we don't care what you do as a group. You might do Bible study. You might crochet. You know, you might, um, you might uh, have a drum circle. I don't know what you're going to do. You're just going to do something. Here's the reason we don't care what you do. The thing that your group does was just a hook to get you to meet the people in your group so that at some point in your life, you would have a relationship where you'd be able to say, here's what's really going on. Because every one of us is wearing a mask. Every one of us. I'm wearing a mask right now. It's true. There's stuff going on in my life. I, I got to do my best to get up here and be transparent and be vulnerable and tell you, you know, like I, there was a season I didn't nurture. I'm like, I'm being vulnerable. But I don't get up here and I'm like, you know what, church, I'm discouraged today. Like, no, that's my job is to encourage you, right? Like, <laughs> so I don't tell you everything, but I got people I do. If I'm discouraged, I, I, have, I have people in my life, and not just one, that within 24 hours they know if I'm discouraged, if I'm going through a rough time. Within 24 hours, you need to have those ride or dies in your life, you need to have some godly friends. Listen, everybody doesn't need to know what you're going through. Somebody does. That's why we do not care what you do in your groups. I mean, don't get too crazy, right? Like, you know, don't, um, I'm not even gonna say it because I would pick something that you would wanna do. And I would think it was funny and you wouldn't. And uh, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Uh, you need my church you need some godly friends. And lastly, here's, what you, here's, here's a relationship you need, and you knew it was coming to this. You need an all-in relationship in 2018 with God. You need an all-in relationship with God. I've, only, I've been a lead pastor now for less than a year. 
so there's lots I've yet to experience or see in ministry, but I can tell you one thing I see all the time. People try God. They're like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try God. And it really doesn't make a lot of sense. There's only one way for you to know what a relationship with God looks like. And it's to go all in. It's to go all in in your relationship with God. Twenty eighteen the most important relationship you could have is an all-in relationship with God. The Bible says this in Jeremiah 29. God speaking, he wants you to know this. He says, you will seek me and find me. But listen to this. He says, when you seek me with all your heart. Are you ready for an all-in relationship with God? to know what God is like, to know what he really has for your life. God cannot be a spice that you add to your steak. Glory to God for steak. Feasting is, I love fasting. I love fasting. Feasting is flat out better. I am sick today because feasting is so much better. God cannot be a spice that you mix into your life. You got to go all in. God, I thank you for this house. I thank you for what you're doing in our church. I thank you, God, that 2018 is going to be a year of breakthrough in this place. God, I thank you for the people that have already made decisions to follow you in 2018. I thank you, God, for how the front last week was full of people receiving prayer ministry at our night of prayer uh, and, and worship ministry. God, we thank you for people who just recently made decisions for Christ. God, I pray, Lord, though, that we would now know that the next steps are to go all in with you, to really surrender, God. And maybe you just need to take a moment right now and just have a conversation with God. Because you know, today I was actually talking, I was talking to you. God actually put this word on my heart for you. It's time to go all in with God. And more than my words, you need you need to get to God to find out what that would look like. We're here to help. But you're going to hear God's voice in 2018, calling you, drawing you. He's saying, hey, you're going you're gonna to seek me and you're going to find me in 2018. You are going to find me in 2018. Come on, somebody. This is a word for you today. God is saying to you, you're going to find me in 2018. I will no longer seem hidden. I will no longer seem distant. You are going to find me in 2018, but it is going to take going all in. So just right now with your own words, just begin to say, God, I give you my heart. You're first in my life. Come on, church. Even if God's already first, just begin to declare it with your own words, your own heart. Lord, you're first in my life today. You're first, God. You're first. Maybe you're here this morning and and really, if you've heard kind of nothing else, hear this right now. This is the moment God brought you here for today. If you're, if you're far from God, like you'd say, I don't even know that I have a relationship with God. You say, how do I get that relationship with God? The Bible is very clear. It's not because of your performance. It's because of what Jesus did for you on the cross that you can have an intimate relationship with your heavenly father. So if you're here today and you don't know much about Christianity, the, the essence of the message is this. You can be forgiven and you can be free in a moment if you choose to surrender your life to God through faith in Jesus Christ. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you, if today you'd say, I'm going all in with God. And for you today, that's a decision that you're going to follow Jesus, whether that's for the first time or it's coming back to him. I'm going to ask you in a moment to raise your hand. And, and, and just so you know what we're going to do, we're just going to pray together. We won't center you out, have you stand up, have you walk to the front, have you go to some room and fill out a card. I simply want to pray with you before you leave this place today because it's a heart change that begins your next steps of walking with God. So if that's you in the room today, you'd say, yeah, today I want to begin or restart a relationship with God. Don't leave me out of that prayer. I want to know I'm right with God. Would you just shoot your hand up and hold it up for just a moment? Just between you and God. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Praise God. Thank you, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Let's pray together. Come on, church. Let's just join with those who've just raised their hands and just say this out from your own lips together, all of us together. Come on, say it. Say, dear Jesus, my whole heart is yours, and I choose to follow you and put you first in my life. I'm all in. Because I believe that you died and rose again. So in this moment, January 28th, 2018 I could know that I was forgiven and free and you're first in my life help me follow you in Jesus name amen come on church all over the room let's put our hands together for those who just made that decision today best decision of your life I want everyone to grab the connect card that's in your seat and by everyone go ahead and grab it everyone unless you don't have one that's sitting there because someone knocked it off as they're walking through. Go ahead and grab that. We really want your prayer requests in 2018. Let us know why, how we can pray for you. And especially if today you made that decision to put Jesus first and you just prayed that prayer, check off that little box that says, today I made that decision. Why? That, that decision you just made is an important one. So are your next ones. We want to send you an email with your next steps that you can take in your all-in relationship with Jesus Christ. Come on, everybody. Once again, can we put our hands together for those that made that decision today?